Hello and welcome to Surveyor Says, the podcast from the National Society of Professional Surveyors. Each week, we bring you fascinating guests that are involved in the profession of surveying. We cover a lot of ground, including Table Lay Talk with Gary Kent, Point of Order with the NSPS Joint Government Affairs Team, Future Focus, highlighting current and future leaders of the profession, and everything survey-related in between. Thanks for joining us here on the podcast, and hope you enjoyed listening to this episode of Surveyor Says. Welcome. This is your host, Kurt Sumner, for another episode of Surveyor Says, the NSPS podcast series. I'm glad to be back in the hosting chair. I haven't hosted for uh, some time, uh, several weeks, maybe a couple of months. I don't know. Tim Birch has been taking care of a lot of that, and which is a good thing. He has a better uh, radio television voice than do I. But I'm glad to be back, and I'm particularly glad to be back and talking with our friend Brian Anderson again. If you don't recognize Brian Anderson's name, you may recognize the Tick Terminator. We've had uh, Brian on the show before. We've had some uh, posts in our, our newsletter about what he's doing, and we're always interested in what's happening in the surveying world, and we're coming to the time of year where we really start thinking about ticks. Now, Brian's going to tell us that that may or may not be the correct thing to do. Uh, maybe that maybe they're going to be around more than we think, but just the way we are as surveyors, now we get to the point in time where we're beginning to see some signs of spring. Uh, assuming you're not in the Midwest where it snowed four feet or whatever it was yesterday, but, <laughs> but nonetheless, uh, we're beginning to think about being outdoors more. And with that, we thought it'd be a good time to to uh, talk again with Brian about the whole issue with ticks and what we need to be doing and thinking about. So I guess to begin with, Brian, uh, what is our time frame? And I guess that varies from different parts of the country. Absolutely. It does vary from different parts of the country. I mean, even the West Coast uh, throughout our winter season, because uh, you're in, in Maryland, right? Correct. And I'm in Upper Michigan, and we generally have a quote unquote winter. I mean, we usually have a fair amount of snow. We've had a very mild snow uh, this year. The most we ever had was eight inches at a time. Usually we have a foot and a half at least, you know, piled up. But West Coast, I mean, uh, they're having tick season during the winter when we're not. Uh, so it varies uh, where people live in, in, in the country here. Uh, so uh, right now in our area, you know, well, I kind of call it east of the Mississippi. Uh, springtime is the worst time generally for ticks because uh, they go into a semblance of, of hibernation, so to speak. We'll call it that way just for easier terminology. And in the spring, they come out and, and kind of like a newborn baby. I mean, uh, they are hungry <laughs> <laughs> and they are relentless. And uh, And we're also at that same time of year, we're happy to get out doors too you know because we've kind of been so to speak cooped up a little bit and nice to get out in, into the woods and stuff like that but uh, we got to remember that there's other things out there that are waiting for us too you know to to suck our blood you know? absolutely you know one of the things that that uh as you were talking you talking about a new season and that kind of thing um i'm not sure that i've ever thought about this until we were just talking here before but how do, how does the the procreation for ticks occur. You know, we talk about, are there baby ticks and then adult ticks and how does that all work? I'll give you the life cycle. It's, it's pretty interesting here. Uh, a female gives birth to anywhere between a thousand to 5,000 at a time, usually in the middle of summer, okay? And then they, uh, they're born in a little shape of an egg. After a couple of weeks, they start breaking out of those eggs. All right, not, not like any newborn baby, uh, what do they want? They want food, and their food is blood, all right, from some kind of mammal, you know, whether it's a little animal or us. Now, the little babies like that, they're born on the forest floor, right on the ground level. So the, the most practical animal for them to eat or for them to have their first host in our area is going to be a white-footed mouse, all right? In the south, it's going to be a, a little lizard-like animal called a skink, all right? And so for us, in the northern parts, it's a white-footed mouse. 
they get on that white foot of mouse or that skink and they start sucking the blood out of it. The uh, And they're usually there for a couple days. The pathogens or the germs from that host is what gives them uh, any range of some sort of uh, tick-borne disease. All right, that's where they'll get their Lyme disease. They're not born with those diseases. They get them from their, normally the first host. Now, after a couple days, that little tiny, you know, you can barely see a tick uh, falls off of that that animal, their first host, and they do whatever ticks do, which is not a whole lot. <laughs> they just kind of hang out and, and you know, molt into the next series, uh, which they're born an egg. Then their first series is is the is the larva. Then uh, for us in the north, they morph into the next series over the winter, and they actually grow two more legs. They're born with six, so when they come out in the springtime, they have eight legs. That makes them part of the arachnid family, the spider family. All right. Now, if they got Lyme disease or some kind of tick-borne disease the summer before on their first host, they're going to have it the rest of their life. Now, the bad thing about that is that the springtime when those nymph, now it's a nymph tick, when they come out, you can barely even see them. They're just a little specks, like a little period on, on a sentence practically. But they're just as lethal as an adult if, if we get bit by them. That's why protection is so critical. Uh, so then they're looking for their host. They get on a host. Maybe it's a little bit bigger animal. Uh, maybe it's a raccoon or a rabbit or maybe it's us even too. And uh, then they feed on that for a couple days. They get, they get off and uh, then they molt into the next series over that following winter. And uh, they come out the next spring as, a, as an adult size. Now, every time they get a little bigger, they usually go to a little bit bigger, you know, hosts. And it may be us again or it may be a deer or maybe, uh, you know, a, a wolf or a coyote or something bigger like that, dogs. And uh, especially on the deer, uh, the black-legged ticks, which carry Lyme disease, when they, and they're, they're actually nicknamed a uh, deer tick, they mate on the deer over that winter. All right. So then the next spring when, when uh, adults, you know, uh, are done with the deer, uh, the male drops off and he dies. The female drops off and she gives birth then because they, they mate while they're on the deer over the winter. And uh, she gives birth. And after she gives birth a couple thousand ticks, then uh, <laughs> that's enough to do her in, you know. <laughs> so their typical lifestyle is approximately two to three years, maybe a little longer. Uh, that's most ticks. Now, other ticks you have uh, out in... Uh, they call those are what I'm talking about is hard body ticks. Then you have soft body ticks too, which would be more in the western areas, uh, and they live a little differently, uh, and they could have uh, you know different diseases out there, you know. So uh, that's kind of the lifestyle of ticks, uh, and uh, they're going to be in in uh, low lying brush. I, I always remind people: remember, ticks don't drop out of the sky. They don't fly. They don't uh, they don't jump. Uh, they let, they get on a piece of vegetation, typically a piece of a blade of grass, and they sit there and with their arms open, just wait. They're opportunists, you know, and hitchhikers that we don't want. And they jump on us and they start crawling around looking for uh, a good place to have a meal on us or whatever they're getting onto. So that's kind of lifestyle. So the, the perhaps commonplace fear of having ticks drop on you from trees is less likely or even impossible? Yeah, it's very unlikely. About the only way I think that a tick could drop out of a tree is, let's say, if they're on a on a possum or something, on an animal, and they happen to drop off, because uh, it's extremely rare that they ever crawl up trees. It's extremely rare. I mean, all my reading, you know, that I've done hundreds of hours on, it, it's, it's always on a blade of grass, on a, on a piece of vegetation. Uh, so. But they have gotten on some very crazy things. I, I a couple of years ago, my wife showed me this article on Facebook where this lineman uh, was taking some brush off a power line. Okay, now I have heard that linemen sometimes will see ticks crawling on hot wires. Okay, doesn't bother them. Of course, they're not grounded. You no, know? I don't know how they got to that point. But anyways, he took this branch off of a uh, of a power line and. So, <laughs> excuse me. Somehow or another, he got uh, this tick in his eyeball. A tiny little one. I mean, and he didn't even know it was a tick at first, of course. You know, he goes back to the shop there and, and they're doing, they did everything right. I mean, he had safety glass on. He did, I mean, so it's just crazy freak accident. 
and uh, they, they tried to wash it out after a couple hours. They couldn't get it out, so they took him to an ophthalmologist. And a guy, you can see the picture on Facebook. It's this little tiny speck, and they had to pull it off. His white of his eyeball was a little tiny tick. I mean, I guess the quiver is just to think about that, you know. Oh, my gosh, a tick on the eyeball. But he's all fine now. Uh, they did all the right stuff. And, uh, I mean, that'll probably never happen. That's only happened a couple of times. But, yeah. So just, just out of curiosity, uh, and everyone listening to this will be praying it never happens to them, of course, uh, as will I. But if if they didn't figure it out or somehow the tick lingered there longer, would it have had an, a, a, a mechanism or a, a way that it would, uh, for lack of a better term, drill in to his body through through his eye or on his eyelid? Or is, is there any it, information it, I, about how that might have worked? It was already attached to the white of his eye. Oh, wow. It wasn't that floating around it. It was attached to it. Yeah. So that's another thing about ticks. The shorter amount of time they're on you, the less likely you are to get any disease from them. You know, they say 24 hours is approximate 24 hours plus. So that's, you know, uh, that's a time that uh, typically a tick would uh, be able to have enough time to, you know, spit, for lack of better words, spit some, some bad stuff into the person and uh, where they could potentially have some kind of disease. Yeah, I guess in some ways, uh, maybe that, 24 hour time frame you're talking about provides some level of hope, I guess I won't say encouragement, but like if we're out working in the field and serving like we always are. And of course, if you're in the right places at the right time of the year, you're going to, going to look for the ticks. Yeah. Um, so it, it's helpful to know that perhaps even if they're there, or even if they've, they've gone inside your, your skin, um, there's still a time frame there before it's maybe maybe dangerous. I can recall, I may have mentioned this last time I had you on the show, having woken up on a Saturday morning after being in the field on Friday and done my total tick check, as I always do, and then I wake up with one anyway. Yeah. And, and it's already st stuck in my skin. So if, if I'm understanding you correctly, if that was within a certain period of time, then the chances are they couldn't have transferred a disease to me. Correct. Yeah. The shorter amount of time, the better. 24 hours, they say, is kind of the, if you want to call it a magic number, but I mean, yeah, it could be 22 hours. It could be, you know, whatever. Sure. But that's approximate they, is what they figure. That's why I'm glad what you said, you did a tick check. And I mean, I was out Saturday here was like 55. So that was a beautiful day for us, you know what I mean? Springtime. And uh, I, I had, you know, my everything, of course, I'm the tick terminator, you know, so I, I spray my socks, pants, shirt, and everything and uh i was out in what could have been tick area the grass is, is laying down now it hasn't spruced up yet by any means yet but even after then uh, that night when i showered saturday night when i showered uh i checked over everything you know uh just just to make sure you know you just never know even under the best of circumstances you know uh those darn little suckers can still get in and, and pass taking the best precaution that you can. And, and believe me, I do, you know. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sure most of the people, particularly folks we're talking to uh, primarily here are surveyors. And, and I, I'm guessing that everybody is aware of this, or if they're not, they will be soon enough um, of the whole issue with ticks. But my guess is most people who live in, in tick areas are very aware of that whole tick check thing. <laughs> I mean, it's just, yeah. it's an absolute essential regardless of what you might have been doing. I mean, you didn't have to be in the woods for it to happen, right? For sure. I mean, they're, they're saying that they're even more and more coming into uh, residential areas. Uh, ticks are not going away. I wish they were, you know, but it's we got to live with them. So, I mean, that's why I, I'm all about prevention. I'm not a Lyme expert by any mean, means, you know, all those tick, you know, anaplasmosis, babesiosis, you know, uh, and plus what all those different diseases are, you know, I am not an expert in that. I'm all about prevention. And that's why it's so important for like surveyors that are out walking through the grass and walking through the woods and walking through areas like that to treat their clothes with permethrin is the best stuff out there uh, to drastically cut down the, 
the opportunity for them to get bitten by a tick drastically. So just for the sake of those who haven't seen your articles or perhaps listened to our other podcast, I'm looking at your logo in the back. And so um, I want everybody to feel comfortable that uh, you really don't have to have a hand grenade from the tick terminator to get rid of ticks, right? <laughs> <laughs> now, can they see that or will they see that? Uh, uh, no, they won't, but, but they will see it in, in advertisements or, you know, that kind of thing. So I was just, well, we should tell them that, that my logo is a tick in the shape of a hand grenade. Uh, so it's pretty, an, it is an explosive uh, logo, if you want to call it that. And we have a lot of fun with it. I mean, just to name the tick Terminator is enough. I, I can't even say it with a straight face, you know. Uh, so we have a lot of fun with it. But How did, how did you um, come across your thought of, of tick Terminator as, as sort of a, a logo? It's pretty cool. Well, I had the logo professionally made. Uh, I'm not smart enough to do something like that. And I thought, man, I want to do that and, and have it done right and have it look very professional. I had already had the name, the Tick Terminator, established, you know, for myself. And, of course, that's the name of my website, and I own that name. But it's, uh, but when he, he the, the logo guy sent me that back, I thought, that's it. You know, that, that was it. He, he hit the jackpot on that because there's nothing like it out there. So yeah, uh, we sure. definitely have a lot of fun with it. But we also want to talk about COVID, too. Absolutely. Uh, uh, because that's such a big part of what we deal with. And uh, uh, the thing with COVID and Lyme disease, stuff like that, is there's the problem is the, the symptoms, if somebody gets Lyme, is very, very similar to COVID. I mean, achy joints, flu-like symptoms, you know, just find, kind of feeling crappy. Uh, but if somebody was ever bit by a tick, uh, they sometimes you're bit by a tick and you don't even know it, I mean, which is really sad. Uh, but that can happen sometimes. But if you're bit by a tick and if it does uh, uh, become infected, if you do happen to get a, a they call a, a bullseye rash, that's not on all of them, uh, if they break out somehow from that tick, they absolutely definitely should see a physician, okay? And what happens, uh, hopefully the physician is aware of Lyme disease too uh, or some kind of tick-borne disease because – a lot of times when somebody gets bit by a tick early on, they cannot do a, a test and have it get good results because what happens is it needs to be in the system for you know months before a positive test result can come back. And by then it's too late. So a good doctor will say, hey, you've got flu-like symptoms, you've got achy joints, you're feeling really crappy, the, the, the tick bite here it is, it looks really bad. And more than likely, they'll probably put them on a round of antibiotics. And I'm not a doctor here, but typically it's going to be doxycycline, which is uh, very common for most tick-borne diseases, not all of them. And that will kill in the beginning. My whole point here is this. Early detection and early treatment is absolutely critical for tick-borne diseases. All right. Do not put it off because those diseases never get better. They only get worse they never get better not like a cold or something like that you know or, so that's well, my maybe, biggest thing. I, I was gonna say maybe you could talk a little bit about other diseases because i think for the most part people who are going to be listening to this are thinking of it from the same perspective that i would uh, as, as a surveyor that that we're talking about lyme um, yeah may, maybe we're not thinking about other things so tell us about that no there's other diseases like uh Babesiosis, uh, auriculosis, uh, uh, tularemia, uh, anaplasmosis. And there's, uh, those are in different areas. Uh, you know, man, a lot of them throughout the United States. Uh, there's also uh, one called alpha gale syndrome. Uh, that's more in the southwest, they say, or southeast, I'm sorry, where somebody actually gets allergic to red meat. Wow. And kind of permanently. So uh, they, they don't know that sometimes until they eat some red meat and then sometimes they go into anaphylactic shock. Uh, so it's, it's some bad stuff, you know, that can happen. 
So I'm not an expert on all those diseases, but I know that, you know, of course, like Lyme disease, for example, is, is a New England area. Uh, that's for sure. You know, it's, it's spreading even more. That's a, the Lyme disease was actually given a name in Lyme, Connecticut in the, in the 70s because of arthritic condition among teenagers. And then uh, the other the big uh, area is, is where I live. I live in Upper Michigan, but we're right on the border of Wisconsin, Minnesota, going down into, uh, you know, Illinois and, and uh, Iowa. That's more the Lyme belt there. But then uh, other ones, you know, like the Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever. That's not just in the Rockies. Looking at a map right here, that's up the uh, eastern shoreline uh, in the states, you know, like uh, Arkansas, Louisiana, you know, uh, Tennessee, Kentucky, areas like that. Uh, so there's pretty much ticks almost all over. Worse in other areas than, you know, some areas than, than others. Uh, but that it, it's, it's, it's all about prevention, you know. Yeah, I remember... Yeah. A couple of centuries ago, when I first started working in the field as a surveyor, um, the big thing that, that you always heard from everybody about ticks and disease was Lyme. Um, yeah. You never heard anybody talk about anything else. Or Rocky Mountain spotted fever, you, you heard that. And, yeah. of course, that scared everybody to death because it sounded yeah. so exotic, you know? yeah. <laughs> but in a sense. Uh, but I'm, I'm thinking sort of based on our conversation here, it might not be a bad idea for to get you to write an article for us for our newsletter, just sort of talking about these other diseases, because a lot of people will hear this broadcast, but a lot of our members may not. Everybody sees our, our newsletter. So it, it wouldn't be a bad idea. It wouldn't even have to be a really long article, just sort of an introduction of, hey, here, here are diseases, not just Lyme or Rocky Mountain. Yeah, I'd be glad to do that. Yeah, it'd be super. A couple more things I want to mention here, too, is uh, just reading just the other day, you know, about Lyme and COVID. Uh, Agenix, which is a company that uh, uh, tests for Lyme disease and ticks and stuff like that, uh, wrote an article just a couple of months ago. It was right at the end. You know, it was December 29th. And I'm just going to read a snippet of it here uh, where it talks about Lyme can be a risk factor for COVID complications. I, I want especially business owners to be thinking about this. You know, when they have uh, a lot of their surveyors out there in the field, uh, Lyme and other tick-borne diseases can compromise the immune system, making it harder to fight off illnesses like COVID-19. We probably heard about that, you know, how our immune system has to be at its best to fight off these different diseases. Additionally, a compromised immune system may make it more likely that a COVID infection will have more severe symptoms and or require hospitalization. Patients with untreated, undertreated, or chronic Lyme may ha be at a higher risk and should take extra care to follow the latest COVID safety precautions. So uh, that's why another thing coming back to the prevention is so important. And that's why I tell people to treat your clothes, you know what I mean, uh, with this stuff and, and uh, protect yourselves out there to try to stay as healthy as you can. Uh, it's going to help with, with uh, tick-borne diseases. Plus, it's going to help you know keep your immune system better. So in case you do get COVID, you can fight that better, too. Right. So. And all of those things you're talking about, again, I think for a typical person, not just the typical surveyor, but the typical person, I, I'm not sure that would be uppermost in anybody's mind, honestly, if they didn't yeah. hear about it in, in forum like this. Yeah. Or I've also developed about. something this, this spring here, just in January. I call it the Tick Prevention Safety Guide. I've been sending this out to businesses, especially, and a lot, I work with a lot of safety directors from a lot of companies, let's say, uh, if it's a survey company uh, or a uh, power company or a company that, that trims trees in, in the right-of-ways, and it's got some really, really good, it's nothing about sales, it's all about uh, tick habitat, you know, species, uh, where ticks are, and a lot about prevention, the best things to use. Uh, and then uh, even end of the day tick checks too, you know how important that is, like you mentioned there. So it's got a lot of really good information that that I gladly hand out to people. And I said I don't care if you copy it, whatever you want to do with it, you know. Uh, but it, it's very, very. Uh, I took me. I had several safety guys ask me to put something like that together so that they could use that 
uh, for their people. Let's say this spring in there, we'll call it their TikTok, you know, <laughs> where, where they're actually doing that. So anyways, that's a real good source for them to have as like a desk reference, you know. I've done all the research. Here it is, you know, uh, for them to have. Right. So. And it sounds like from our conversation, and, and, and maybe we touched on this a little bit before, but sounds like that probably nobody in the country is in a place where they're 100 percent safe all the time from tick or tick-borne disease. Pretty much, yeah. They're, they're out there all over the place. There's 900 species in, in the world of ticks. We don't have that many here. But, yeah, they are all over. I mean, birds that we don't think of. You know, birds carry them from different places to places because they get on birds, you know, and they drop off and they start a new thing there. That's why they're they're worse now than what they used to be. And we and live more in rural areas now, too, and animals, you know, we're, we're very mobile nowadays, the more more mobile now than we were 60, 70 years ago, you know. Yeah, that you you bringing that up about the travel. Uh, we, you and I were talking before we came on our about my property in the, in the mountains, Blue Ridge Mountains in Virginia. And we have a, a, a bird that comes there in the spring and summer. And I think I'm going to get the name right. It's called a kill deer. Oh, yeah. And my son did some research on it and found out that they actually travel several thousand miles from each migration from, you know, if they hatch eggs on my property, then those little fledglings somewhere along the way are going to end up in South America or somewhere. So yeah. it's, it's pretty, pretty crazy to think about how far, you know, these kind of things uh, go across the world. So just the point being, yeah, it can spread pretty easily from animals that travel like that. They also say that the uh, global, I hate to say global warming, well, let's say climate change a little bit. It's a little warmer now. And uh, that's helped the tick population increase even more, uh, which is a shame. <laughs> you know, we're trying to kill them off, but we can't. Uh, that's just helped them, you know, because they need a little bit warmer weather. Uh, moist weather is what they need, too. They, they don't like dry, super, super dry places. They'll go down in the leaf litter, you know, to, to, uh, to get that moisture. So uh, they're not going away anytime soon. That's why I come back to protection again. You know, you, you got to protect yourselves. Yeah, and I really appreciate you joining me um, for another forum. Of course, we did the radio show before and, and look forward to the information that you sent us from time to time for our newsletter. Um, but I really appreciate you being on because these are the kind of things that, yeah, you, you hear about them, but it, it, it's never too often to be able to reaffirm the information for people and, and get it out there. So even if you heard this before, you hear that hear what we're doing today and you'll think, oh yeah, right. I need to be thinking about that more. So exactly. It's important. So I, I really appreciate you doing it for us. You bet. Well, with that, uh, I guess we'll end our day's session and, and thank you again for being with us. And I'll look forward to chatting with you more about getting some information into our newsletter and other outlets so we can, can help people further. So we, we can chat about that as we go along. Curtis, I also want to say, too, that they can go to my website, too, uh, for more information, too, at the Tick Terminator, thetickterminator.com, uh, and they can, you know, look at the products, order products there, too, and, and uh, contact me that way. I'm not sure if my phone, my phone number may be on there, especially for businesses, uh, to call me. But, uh, yeah, I look forward to this, you know, continue on, and, and uh, I always enjoy talking with you, that's for sure. Thanks. I appreciate it very much. Take care. We'll be talking soon, I'm, I'm sure. Thank you, sir. You've been listening to the Surveyor Says podcast, brought to you by the National Society of Professional Surveyors. If you have any questions about today's episode or any other topic, please email us at info at nsps.us.com, and we are here to help. Visit our website, nsps.us.com, to learn more about our association, the programs we administer and support, our sustaining members, and information about future episodes of Surveyor Says. Subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Spotify, as well as our podcast host, Podbean. And remember, it's a great day to be a surveyor.